Thank you. So I'm Ellie from SCAPE. We are an organisation who work on the archaeology of Scotland's coast. So I'm presenting a case study today about maritime coastal estuarine landscape on the east coast of Scotland in the Firth of Thorpe. Um, so this is uh, the view from our site. Um, it's a landscape of, of mobility now these are two key bridges that connect the central belt, the lowlands of Scotland with the north. And this landscape really sort of represents a microscosm of the wider Firth of Forth estuary. So our site, um, I would say, really exemplifies the coastline as a resource in itself, in that it provides access to water to, and the, and, uh, to the sea, which provides opportunities for transport, for trade, for communication, but also for a range of other purposes as well. So for um, military purposes, um, for industrial use, for agriculture, as well as for um, other economic uses such as fishing. And of course, um, the coastline also presents opportunities for reclamation as well, to gain more land for, for agriculture. So just to say this is uh, very much a collaborative project. These are some of the key collaborators who've worked with us on this site. And uh, because of the nature of the project, volunteers have been involved in all aspects of our fieldwork and investigation. Without them, none of this project could, um, could have been done. So um, this is the Firth of Forth on the east coast of Scotland. It's a large uh, tidal estuary. Um, our site sits on the south coast, of, um, about two thirds of the way between Edinburgh and Stirling, two of Scotland's historic uh, power bases. And um, it really it's, it sits within a, a landscape that's been very heavily modified both in itself um, and within an estuary that's been, that's been very heavily modified as well. Um, it's called Higgins Nuke. Now, Nuke is a historic Scottish word that actually means a small promontory of land that juts out into water, which is uh, which I want you to, to remember. So there we are. That's the River Forth there in the middle, and that's their site. Um, so it's defined by this meandering water course here, the Pound Burn. And the mouth of the power barn has been the focal point for a range of activities uh, for many centuries from the medieval period onwards. Um, so this is a very artificial and an engineered landscape. It's been subject to the natural inputs of the tanks coming up the River Forth, the input of the um, forth coming downstream, as well as the input of the of the power barn itself. But it's also a landscape that's been very uh, modified by human agency as well, which has had both uh, intended and unintended consequences for the landscape. So it's been um, consciously formed and, and altered, and it's a landscape that we're going to look at at a range of scales as well. Um, there's been a range of levels of agency have operated on this landscape, both in this specific site and in the wider estuary as well. So uh, one of the first things we did to investigate this particular site was to do a uh, drone survey which allows us to create a detailed three-dimensional model of the landscape and that really is the basis of our start for, for actually really understanding this site. So I just want to discuss the four different aspects of um, the use of this history of, of the site through its history starting really with the sort of coastal dimension. It's a, it's a coastal landscape, it's a landscape of mobility. Because of its location it's got um, access uh, along the river out to the sea to sort of international connections but it's also connected across the river <coughs> through that to the north of Scotland. Um, there's been a harbour and ferry here from the 14th century onwards. As early as the 15th century there were complaints about sedimentation and siltation here but it really has been from that period onwards all about access, transport, communication and trade with a lot of construction of uh, artificial structures to facilitate that. But it's also a military landscape uh, within the very defined period of the early 16th century, thanks to King James IV of Scotland, um, who um, has been described as being obsessed with the development of his navy during the wars against Henry VIII of England. So he constructed a maintenance and fitting out yard for, for the ships of his navy, and he selected our site at Higgins Nuke. Uh, we think probably because the main dockyards were uh, just outside Edinburgh and Leith, that was very vulnerable to raids by the English. So he selected our site here because it's inland, it's more defensive, whilst still offering access to the coast and to a deep water port as well. Um, so during that time, it was our maintenance and fitting yard. It was really a focal point for um, all of Scotland's resources were poured into this area, as well as um, 
expertise and materials from our allies across Europe, so from France, from Flanders, Scandinavia, Portugal and Spain, sent all sorts of help and assistance to Scotland to this particular site. Uh, it was probably selected because it was already in use as an existing harbour. Um, it was already in um, Crown ownership um, and there's also access to resources in the hinterland such as woodland as well. Um, there was certainly vast royal investment in the site in the 16th century and in the development of the Navy. This is the, the Great Michael, the flagship of James's Navy. Um, it was a leader in the naval arms race in which the sort of monarchs of Europe were engaged in the early 16th century. She was the largest ship in Europe when she was launched in 1512, and our site of Higgins Nuke was built particularly for this, this massive ship. So, um, although this, this map, which dates to just about 50 years after the end of our uh, dockyard period, it shows three ships um, on our, uh, just outside our site. It's the only place in Europe where this map, sh in Scotland, sorry, where this map shows any ships at all, but with the defeat of Scotland and uh, the Battle of Flodden in 1513, everything came to an abrupt end and the site of our dockyard was effectively lost completely. So the search for that has been a large part of this project. But it's also an industrial landscape following the end of the dockyard period. There was a lot of manipulation of the landscape for a uh, water mill, for uh, grinding corn. And this really was all about water management features. So there was significant alteration of the channel of the Cowbar. This entire former loop of it was, was cut off artificially and turned into a mill pond. Uh, the earliest map for that is 1784. Uh, so that north boundary is in fact the Cowburn. Our site's up there and you can actually see in that top corner the artificial cutting that straightened the line of the channel has created that uh, meander really just to act as a, as a mill pond. It was then culverted to the site of our mill, it powered the wheel, flowed out into the River Forth, but that channel was probably also used to allow the tidal waters of the Forth inland, allowing the mill to operate as a tidal mill as well. A second mill was added a few years later, um, and uh, harnessed for a brief period, both, both mills harnessed that water um, from the construction of the, the mill down in the sluice, but that also caused conflicts of interest with landowners upstream as well, who had fishing rights and harbours that were impacted by that. Finally, this is also very agricultural landscape, obviously, throughout most of its history, with particular manipulation in the 17th and 18th centuries. So, um, first off, with the impact of any land scale, large scale landscape um, alterations upstream, this is Concarn Moss just north of Stirling. So, if Stirling is down here, our site is, is downstream of that. Um, Concarn Moss is just to the northwest <coughs> of Stirling, so upstream of our site. So this vast area is just a, a huge peat bog that was drained in from the uh, late 17th century through to the 19th century to provide land for, for reclamation. Um, so they cut all the peat, but they didn't treat that as a resource. They just allowed it to float down the river, um, which contributed a huge amount of mud and sediment into the system. Um, it, it was a complete disaster for the Firth of Forth. It's been described as the first um, ecological disaster in Scotland, and it completely destroyed the fishing industry as well. Um, of course, being, um, ah yes, and even in the 19th century, um, if our site is there, the Admiralty charts are still showing drifted peaks as a significant aspect that really altered the, um, the navigability of the River Forth. Being a coastal estuarine landscape also provides opportunities to claim further land from the sea for, for agriculture. It's been estimated that between 45 and 50 percent of the Forth's intertidal area has been lost to land reclamation in the past 400 years. So just to look at an example just north of our site, our site Higgins Nuke is down here, and just to the north of that, you can see the successive lines of sea banks going out to the river forth. So all of that area, nearly a kilometre of land, has been claimed from the river over the past few hundred years. And again, if we just go back to this map here, just south of our site, that's a proposed sea bank again for further reclamation. So all of that activity basically stopped our site of Higgins Nuke being a promontory jutting out into the water. So there's now land on, on both sides of, of our site. Um, it's also exists within an agricultural landscape in the sense of droving. So this, uh, there's a vast network of drove roads uh, from, where cattle were taken from all across the islands in the north of Scotland down to the large cattle fairs in Falkirk, just south of our site. So Higgins Nuke uh, was at the, the crux of that. It was the main crossing point where all of the cattle 
from basically all of the north of Scotland crossed at this ferry here. There are two main crossing points there on the Alwa. They're completely spread in two expenses, so the one became the most important one. But of course, what that meant, there's a huge amount of construction of infrastructure, piers and seawalls, in order to facilitate that. Um, from that point onwards, from the construction of some of these piers, there were um, increasing complaints about the problems of siltation and sedimentation, and there were complaints from the 18th and 19th centuries of people having to wade for hundreds of yards through the intertidal mud to, to get to the boat, and multiple piers having to be constructed within a very short period of time. So looking at our site then, some of the physical evidence of those different aspects of landscape manipulation. Uh, this channel has been completely artificially modified, this loop has been completely cut off. There's been significant construction of a seawall formalising the coast edge for access at some point. This embayment, which is a former channel, has been enclosed by the construction of an earthwork bank. And there's been all sorts of intertidal infrastructure constructed to manage access there as well. Um, but for us, archaeologically, there's been this massive um, build-up of the salt marsh, which has really altered the way that we can actually start to understand this landscape. So in terms of our investigation, we peppered the site initially with, with boreholes, with a programme of coring, and we also did a, a small excavation there as well, targeting the known features. So um, in terms of the coring, uh, what that did was confirm that most of this landscape uh, had been formed by the early Iron Age, that the salt marsh um, outside the seawall went, went down very deep. It confirmed that this was some sort of an erosion feature or a, a former channel. And this dense uh, patch here really was targeting the old stone pier that we knew of from the historic maps. So uh, by simple dint of working out in a line and coding down until we hit the top of a stone structure, we mapped a stone feature nearly 40 metres long, 5 metres wide and sloping down gradually. We got peat which yielded, surprisingly, late Iron Age dates, which was surprising given we were expecting it to be a post-medieval stone pier. So we targeted that in one half of our excavation and that confirmed that we were in fact looking at a post-medieval stone pier with an access track from the road. Um, we were only able to actually look at the top, the landward end of it, because of the logistics of actually digging in that deep salt marsh. So it's butting up against the seawall. It appears to have been realigned and refaced at one point, possibly as an attempt to manage the problem of sedimentation. It's constructed on a pine plank that gave us an 18th century date. So again, that's confirming that those Iron Age dates from the peat are probably redeposited from the material that was floated down from the drainage of the peat bog. There's also a huge amount of chaff in the system right at the bottom of this. So this is about two and a half metres down, butting up against the bottom of the seawall, which shows how rapidly that salt marsh has, has formed. And again, that indicates that at that time, this is a very low energy depositional environment um, where lots of material is being deposited very, very rapidly. Um, of course, also indicates the other aspect of this site, the mill. So again, this is the, the old channel um, that was, was cut off by the um, modification of the main burn. The main channel came down under the site of the road to the site of the mill. And there we are, that's the site of the mill and the lead relative to the pier. So um, this appears, this mill lead appears to be the natural channel. Um, the upper fill was absolutely full of 20th century material, so it was still open um, and acting really as a landfill site of the 20th century. It's a coronation mug event, Edward VII, which is extremely dateable, fortunately. Um, we've got sloping clay banks, the natural banks of the, of the natural channel, modified by the insertion of a stone wall on one side, probably the same on the other side, though that's been robbed out. Um, and there's a timber and iron structure in that, which appears to form some sort of sluice gate, controlling the flow of the water out, but also probably letting the tidal water in to allow the mill to operate according to the, the tides as well. Um, so we know this mill was out of use from the 19th century, at which point they lost the action of the mill leet um, sluicing, the, sluicing the landscape. And we know from the amount of chaff in the system that you find in the salt marsh that this was a depositional environment. And that, that seems to have had a dramatic impact on the formation of the salt marsh. In fact, you could really argue that the salt marsh is an artificial man-made landscape feature caused by the drainage of the moth, of the peat bog, the... Um, Drifted peat that was uh, incorporated, exacerbated by landscape management practices, and the end of the mill period as well. And from an archaeological point of view, that's caused us serious problems for burying our evidence of our earlier features as well.
So if we go back to our drone survey, we were able to map the various stages of the tide against that. So if you look at the um, site at low tide, as opposed to the site at high tide, as it would have been without the formation of the salt marsh and without the artificially engineered features that got in the way. And you can see how dramatically it's altered the landscape just in the past couple hundred years since these features were constructed and since the salt marsh was formed. And the end result of that is that the site of the docks, which we think was in here, with this channel, and this agreement probably providing the access. That site has now been completely cut off from the sea altogether. There's, um, it's very difficult to imagine now, when you see the site at low tide, that there could ever have been large ships the size of the Great Michael that came up to this site. Although when we were doing our excavation, there was one particularly high spring tide, and but only at these ex sort of exceptional events can you actually see that this is still, in some senses, an intertidal and coastal landscape. So this is a landscape that's been altered by human agency um, at a range of power levels from the powerful monarchs of Scotland's medieval period all the way down through local landowners to the local 19th century miller. And that's a dramatic environmental consequences, both intended and unintended, on the landscape with a range of conflicting uh, interests. It's caused for huge problems of sedimentation of, um, and we've seen attempts to manage that and the refacing and realignment of the, of the stone pier. Um, but the end result, effectively, was that these um, modifications and their impact really destroyed the very attributes that made these sites so attractive in the first place in terms of providing access to the coastline and then to the wider sea, um, which resulted ultimately in the abandonment of this area and the shifting of the focal point of all those maritime activities further, further east. So it's a landscape that's worked, um, exists within a wide network of communication, um, connections and influences from the, from the very local with the input of the mill, the construction of the seawall, uh, the sluicing action of the mill lead, um, up to the local, so the impact of reclamation both to the south and the north of the site, which have stopped it being that promontory jutting out into the, into the River Forth, as well as the input of the large-scale landscape modifications, such as the drainage of the peat bog upstream. But it also existed originally within our national network of those drove roads. It's a key point for um, Scotland's agricultural economy throughout the 18th and 19th centuries by facilitating that access. But if we go re but right back to the medieval period, it was, a, it was a key player actually within the sort of network of European international politics uh, for all of those allies working together in the wars against Scotland and England. So it really was originally once passed of this sort of part of this vast European landscape of, of network and politics. So I'd just like to say thank you very much to everyone who supported the project and especially to the volunteers without being none of this. Thank you.